My name is Anthony Ammons, co-star of the Emmy-nominated documentary, Cue Ball. The following episode of Ear Hustle contains language and content that may not be suitable for all listeners. Discretion is advised. So what's the feeling on the yard about who's going to win? Uh, all the money's on T-Dub. And that's why I'm going to go play my best, my hardest, and make them all believers because you shouldn't underestimate people. I'm going to whoop them for all the nerds, everybody who's not athletic, who didn't get to play sports growing up because nobody picked them. I'm doing this for us. Can you introduce yourself? My name is Trevor Woods, um, a.k.a. T-Dub. And um, I'm out here finna play this guy, New York Ear Hustle. What is he, a commentator, a, a, a comedian, a host? New York been calling me out, and he is not on my level, and I will show him today. Hey, E. Hey, Nige. You sound a little under the weather. Yeah, unfortunately. Okay, it is not COVID. It's just a regular old cold. But, Erlon, there was no way I was going to miss this one. Nah, no way. I mean, we've been waiting on this for a long-ass time. I got truly. Our partner inside, Rasan New York Thomas, is going to take on Mr. All-American, All Mouth, the guy that introduced me to crime. Um, do you mean your brother Trevor? That's who I mean. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a resident of San Quentin and was my celly for a while when I was still in there. Right. So, we have been waiting for this game for a long time, and we have also been waiting to do this episode for a long time. That's right. Oh, my God. Yeah. New York has been wanting to do an episode about sports in San Quentin since 2018. Totally. I mean, he pitched it every season, and every season, for whatever reason, we just couldn't quite get to it. So today, New York's dream will finally become a reality, even if his dreams don't work out on the basketball court. Not. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Not so fast. I think, and I know New York thinks, he has the wind to totally sail by Trevor. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be honest here. Mm -hmm. My heart is for New York. And so that's where I'm putting my money. But I am just a little worried. You might as well give me that money now. <laughs> my brother was all American. Sports is what he did, Naj. And he was good at it. And I've seen New York's game. And he got this elementary school game. Like What? Wait, what does that mean? He hasn't advanced his shit since the second grade. Oh, man, you are harsh. Okay, I'm going to go inside and do a play-by-play -play with New York. I will see you, Erlon, at the halftime where we'll catch up on the game between your brother and New York. Why don't you leave your money out here, though? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Nigel Poor. And I'm Erlon Woods. This is Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. Dunk time. Is any of them going to dunk, Nige? Uh, Erlon, I think they're all too old to dunk. <laughs> they probably won't even get this high off the ground. No. Brasson, New York Thomas. What's up, Nige? We are finally, at long last, doing your precious... Sports episode. Finally, Nige, <laughs> after all these years on the show, mm -hmm. 2021 is the year it all comes together. Hallelujah. Yes. I know. You've been talking about this forever. And you also know that I'm not much of a sports person. So you're probably going to have to guide me through this. Well, the thing is, sports is huge in prison, Nigel. Mm -hmm. It's an outlet for stress, a way to live dreams deferred, a positive way of proving yourself. And I don't think you need to understand sports to see that it's way bigger than the game to us. Yeah, totally. And New York, I definitely know it's big for you because when I first met you, you were the sports editor at the San Quentin News, yeah. right? And so every time I came in here, you were all sports, 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 sports. And you actually had another sport, which um, I'm going to call shit talking. Shit talking <laughs> is definitely a sport in prison. <laughs> Fair enough. And, you know, I think some listeners might actually be surprised at how many sports are played inside San Quentin. Yeah, I think that when you think of prison, you probably just think of guys playing basketball. Totally. But if you come to the yard on a Saturday morning, mm -hmm. you'll see guys playing tennis, guys playing baseball, the yep. basketball will be going down. And if you look hard enough, you'll see some guys throwing horseshoes. <laughs> <laughs> they got everything in here, but they no croquet. They got everything. No croquet. 
but don't give me any ideas. <laughs> yeah, and there are actually teams that come in from the outside too, which is really cool. Um, I think there's something like 30 different baseball teams that come in here. Yeah. Right? And there's basketball, and they are top notch players. We're not talking about people who washed out, right? No, Division I, G mm-hmm. League, some retired NBA players. It's impressive. It's really impressive. And there's another thing that has to do with sports that um, kind of sticks in my mind. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> okay, our colleague Rashid told me about um, a, a certain list uh, that somebody keeps. I want to put it out there. New York has an extensive list of victims. Like, as a matter of fact, when we play this on the show, I want you to do the dun dun The special victims unit sound, because New York has victims, right? And they are reputable ball players. The list. I just happen to have it right here. Of course you do. Uh, This piece (laughs) of paper contains the name of every single guy I've overcome (laughs) one-on-one on that basketball court. Oh, my God. That is obsessive. How many names are on there? Uh, just maybe 71? <laughs> maybe 71. Exactly. <laughs> is this just San Quentin? That is just San Quentin. Please don't tell me you have this for other prisons you've been in. I don't have them anymore, but I did have <laughs> one at each prison. <laughs> I did not know you were such a list keeper. And there's been some list developments recently, Nigel. Oh, yeah? I sat down to talk with one of our friends about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How come you got some shiny earphones and I ain't got none? You can have the beat-up ones. Oh, I, <laughs> I like how you treat your guests. Nice hospitality. But go ahead, talk to me. That's got to be Nephew. It is indeed our God Nephew. And I just found out that he has a list, too. So um, I've, I've been in three different prisons in California. Ooh. And in every prison, because I have this awkward, nerdy basketball style. Yes, you shoot like a dolphin. I, I call it the one hand shot put. You lean all into it like it's a like it's a step. A it's dance seventy percent accurate though. Woo. And so in every prison, I made this list of people I beat one on one because people don't that be, was a, you. Be, be surprised. That was you. I respect now that. Now I heard there's somebody else running around doing this. I respect list thing. that was you. Have you actually seen nephew's list? I have, but he doesn't have quite as many names on it yet. All right. So what's the point of his list? I mean, I get yours. Yours is about trying to prove that you. Um, are actually a decent basketball player. I am, I am. <laughs> I got the proof. But what about Nephew's? Well, with Nephew, he has an agenda. See, he was trying to get drafted into this intramural league, which is this league of like six teams that play each other on the yard. Okay, so all inside dudes. All inside dudes. And nobody picked him up. Oh, Nobody. Ouch. I even got picked up Naj, and I'm like 51 <laughs> years old. So he went to the commissioner, which is like this incarcerated guy named Ishmael, mm-hmm. who runs the league, to plead his case. He said, I'm going to tell all the coaches, you know, hey, look, y'all, what do y'all think about this person? Any of y'all want to pick him up on y'all team? He come back from the meeting. I said, who team I'm on? What's, what's going on? I'm hella just, I'm excited. You feel me? He says, oh, guess what? I forgot. Next time. <laughs> he said, oh, man, it's two people already picked their teams up. It's too late. I walked off my head down. You know, I always been getting told next time. I'm still waiting on next time. You still waiting on next time. It'll never come because next time will never come. I know right? that and I walked off like, man, who this dude think? I'm taller than him. I'm faster than him. I'm younger and I'm light skinned. Who this dude think he's talking to, right? Everybody got their teams going. I can't get in. So that's when Nephew starts making his list. He went after each and every one of those guys who had made the team, challenging them to a one on one. And every time he beat one of them, he added their names to the list. I'm going to start knocking these dudes down. Best two out of three. I can't join a team. I'm going to knock them down, and I'm going to show them what they're missing. I'm going to show them why you are supposed to pick me. Hey, uh, how many people are on your list right now? Right now on my list, there is 17 people. So now, Nephew has his eyes on this guy named Jay. Okay. He has a pretty similar plan style to Nephew, so people call him the White Neff. The White Neff. They got some other dude up here. They calling him the white nef. I'm nephew, but they want to call him the white nef. I heard the white nef knock so, you down, bro. That's why I'm finna clear this. I'm finna clear the mistakes up right now. The game's win by two. It's 15-15, got real close. It came to be 16, so you got to win by two. Everybody knows that. So we get out there, and then we're going to play a series, the best two out of three. But he wins that first game. And so I walked off. What did Tupac say? Get my weight up, pay him back when I'm bigger, right? And then you know what he told me? He said, if I win the second game, there is no third game, and you go on my list. This is what he tells me. <laughs> Jay started the list. Yeah, yeah. He said, then you're going to be the first person on my list. Wow. New York, you know I used to get picked last for teams, too. Yeah, me too. 
And it's weird. I mean, even though it happened a long time ago, you just don't really forget it. You certainly don't. That type of rejection, it hurts. It makes you feel like you're not worthy to be part of the team or even alive. And so it can make you give up on sports or it can make you really determined to prove you belong out there. And that's definitely what happened with this one person I met recently. I'm going to fill the dream. So one evening in the summer, mm -hmm. right after child, I take the recorder out to the baseball field, which is right outside the media lab here. Right. I pass by it all the time when I come in here. I mean, I'm going to say that it's a little scruffy, but it is a true baseball diamond. Like you can see the shape. And the thing that I love about it is that somebody really takes care of it. You can tell that it's cared for, even though it doesn't look pristine. Somebody really cares about that and makes yeah. it look nice. You can see guys out there every morning working on it as the real bases. I mean, it's a real baseball yeah. diamond. And yeah, and in normal times, it's popping with pop flies and there's two official baseball teams in there where there were anyway. Right now, mm -hmm. it's just the A's. But we still have Giants uniform. And every so often, they sweep the dust off the Giants uniforms to play some games against the A's in here. And the San Quentin A's, they are really good. They play these teams from the outside and their last season, they were 38 and two. Wow. But since that last season, the field has been quiet. All the sports were, of course, canceled during the pandemic. So it is really nice to see the players back out on that field. Mm -hmm. It feels like things might finally be getting back to normal. A new season about to happen. Start out, do one round, nice and easy, and then the second round, you're going to do uh, rapid fire. There were about 25 people on the yard, and they were getting ready for tryouts. Can you explain how that works? So the A's have two inside coaches, Coach Will and Coach Anthony, and they have an outside coach, but he couldn't come in because of the pandemic. Okay. And so they go out there and they practice and they practice, and then right before the first team from the community comes in, mm -hmm. they have a tryout to see who gets to play the outside ah. team. And so the people are out on the field, they're hoping to be on the team when the first team of free people comes in. Mm, and that's always exciting, right? Definitely. And there was this one player in particular, a new person that I wanted to talk to. My name is Samantha Gordon, and I've been incarcerated for 25 years. One of the first things you notice about Sam are the tattoos covering her face. Mm -hmm. She has this huge, colorful butterfly across her forehead. I got to ask you about these tattoos. You have tattoos across your forehead, alongside your... Uh, I used to be Wiccan, so part of my religion had to do with Earth base. So I used to consider myself like the butterfly whisperer because I'd pick them up off the fence while they were sitting there hovering. And it seemed like a gift to me, right? So I had it blasted across my forehead because it meant something to me. Sam is transgender. And at first, she wasn't sure how that was going to go over with the team. There was a couple of individuals that uh, voiced their opinion about, well, they're not going to play because uh, Tranny's on the uh, field. Yet when they see my skill level, they like toned down a little bit. Because I let them know, look, I might be trans, but when I'm on the field, I'm just one of the fellas that want to play a game of ball. If I can't play, I'll go on to something else, but I'll still be here to cheer you guys on and support you. You talked about what you're going to do if you don't make the team. But what's the first thing you're going to do if you do make the team? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that'd be a surreal moment for me. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I'll going to relax myself and call my father and let him know I made the team that he didn't think I'd be able to make. So it's not just people out in the field that Sam's trying to prove something to. No, this goes back a long way. I was shy, bashful, gay. Since I've been six years old, it's I wore women's clothes, you know what I mean? I felt like I was a girl the whole entire time. <sighs> Me being different as in gay, and I was more girly than boy, my mom accepted me as a girl. And she wanted girls, and I was the only girl that ever survived in her eyes, right? Because my two sisters before me uh, passed away. So um, I was what was left. Me and my father, we weren't seeing eye to eye. I, I did a lot of things that my dad would call a sissy's sport. 
the gymnastics, the like the floor exercises and walking on your hands and flips and stuff like that. You know what I mean? To him, that was girly exercise. Playing sports and all that stuff, that, that wasn't me. In the early 2000s, Sam got sent to High Desert State Prison near the Nevada border. That's a level four prison, maximum security, and Sam felt like she needed protection in there. She already had some connections from the outside, family members who had been connected to white gangs inside. So when she got to prison, those gangs took her in. The first joint I went to, there it was rocking and rolling, so you had to do what you had to do. And if that meant to be a soldier, that's what you was. They made me into a soldier. They taught me. They taught me how to fight, taught me how to make weapons, how to keister a weapon, everything. And so that's what I did. I was a keeper of knives. I was a keeper of uh, kites. I was a keeper of a lot of stuff. That's pretty intense, New York. Yeah. So the gang was not okay with Sam looking the way she did. No. So she had to cut her hair and stop dressing like a woman. Yeah, and eventually she decided that she didn't want to do what it would take to be in that gang anymore. I listened to the sounds of my mom's voice in the back of my head telling me, look, what are you doing? You're nothing like that. Be true to yourself. And so I did. I came back to being who I am and pushed that other person away. And so off to a SMY yard I went. We've talked about this a few times in New York. An SNY is a sensitive needs yard. And basically, it's a section of the prison where people who have left gangs or maybe are in for what we would call sensitive crimes are housed for their own protection. And another part of being on the SNY yard, it allowed her to live as herself and pick up a new hobby. By 2001, I was in Mill Creek and I started playing ball, became myself, and I was trans woman. They were the only things that kept me Sane. So I played softball. Sam kept playing sports inside, like softball and volleyball. With sports and groups and being out that gang, her points started going down so she can go to a lower level prison. And just last spring, Sam got transferred to San Quentin. And when I got here, and the girls were like, oh yeah, there's no playing football, there's no playing softball, not even handball, because they will not let you. And they tell you, no, we don't want your kind over here. Or they tell you, you can't sit over here. I do what I want to do. And if no one else wants to do it, then I guess I'll be the first. And like I said, there was like three people who said they didn't want to stay because I was coming to the field. Well, two of them stayed, one of them left. The rest of them, right now, helped me. They pushed me to be better than I was the day before. And with that support, I can make it. And there's one player in particular who's been really supportive of Sam's efforts. Oh, my long name is Christopher Antonio Maximus Hickson. I've been down 21 years, going on 22. Max is like one of the top players on the A's. Mm -hmm. And he uses his influence to advocate for acceptance for the LGBTQ community, his community. He's also Sam's main mentor on the team. And it turns out a little bit more than that, too. She had that look like she wanted to get on the field, and that's sort of where our connection arose. And she has a love for the baseball field. She was very interested. That was like something in all my time I've never seen before. When did you first know this is going to be more than just uh, me teaching Sam how to play some baseball? Well, uh, no, it just, it just, it just sort of uh, turned into something, you know, through our conversations. You know, I would come to the yard, and she would be out there. And uh, she had won a throw, and uh, you know, I, you know, without going to, uh, you know, past the PG part, uh, it was just her, uh, her mind. I would say it like that. Her mind is what did it, right? So, um, so this is a two baseball player relationship. Exactly, Nash. Nice. And I could see that becoming a problem. I mean, there aren't so many spots on the team. Yeah, we asked Max if. Their relationship would still be good if one of them made the team and the other one did not. From my view, it'll be kosher. Or, you know, I might want to sleep with one eye open. Hold you know, on, hold on. I got a question for you, bro. Oh, wow. I heard Sam is getting better and better and better. Right. 
What if Sam takes your spot? You know, uh, oof. Uh, if she takes my spot, you know, I'll support her. Will you know, she have to sleep with one eye open? She might. Uh, <laughs> she might. Sam said one thing is for sure if she gets a spot on the A's. So you make the team. Your first call to your dad. is Pop, I made the team. You know, I'm going to throw it in his face. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say now, who's the sissy now? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's probably gonna start soon, right, Tony? It's gotta start soon. I hope it's a 15 minute game. I don't want to be here all day. Oh my God, E. I thought this basketball game the most hyped game of one-on-one in the history of San Quentin sports was never going to (laughs) happen. Was there a crowd around? Oh, yeah, there really was. Guys on all sides of the court, endlessly speculating and shit-talking. People from the media lab were bringing out video equipment to film the event. It was a spectacle. Yeah, I can picture that, Dodge. I remember Mm -hmm. cats used to gather around to watch a game that's been hyped up all week. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So what did the crowd think? Were they calling out for my brother teed up? Or was there noodles on our colleague, New York, a.k.a. Sun? <laughs> Who's going to win? Um, I got my money on Sun. All right, who do you have? Dub. Oh, boy, okay. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm going to ride with the underdog. I'm going to ride with New York. New York. <laughs> all right, all right. This is Alan McIntosh, one of the best basketball players on the yard. He plays for the San Quentin Warriors. His opinion is highly valued. But he might be wrong today. Okay, who do you, if you, can you figure I might be wrong? You don't even know the opinion. Oh, okay. What's yeah, the, what is your opinion? Um, Trevor's gonna beat him bad. Pretty much, yeah. Bragging rights, but that's big around here. You know what I mean? Bragging rights is all we got, Naj. Okay, the general consensus was if it was a battle of pure skill, your brother had it. But if New York could wear Trevor out, he had a chance. Hmm. He might be conditioned because every time my brother called me, he'd be like, yeah, I just got off the track working out, running, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Oh, yeah. That sounds like your brother. Okay, but finally, after all of the shit talking. They're shooting to see who takes the ball out. Okay, New York has the ball. He's posting. Oh, he's trying to use his body. It's not working. Dub is too strong. He can't back him down, and he's swiping at the ball. And things quickly got intense. Our colleague Rashid was helping announce the game for us. Okay. It's it's kind of physical right now. It is. That was very aggressive, Nigel. Thank you. There was so much aggression on that court. I had no idea. Well, New York is a fighter. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. So do you want to change your bet? Nope. I'm going to stick with my brother. I seen him play while I was inside. He he, he got a good game. Okay. He'll back you into the paint. (laughs) <laughs> Honestly, in the first few minutes, it was so hard to tell what to think. I mean, like I said, there was so much bumping and shoving, but you know what there wasn't much of? Dub with the three-pointer, no good. Layup, no good. The jump shot, oh, nope, in and out. He's taking him to the rack. Oh, over the backboard. <laughs> uh, there was not a lot of scoring. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, our friend Greg Eskridge, who's been on a few Ear Hustle episodes in the past. Who's also a talented shit talker. Indeed. And he was on the sidelines. He felt bad for me and our producer, Amy. Nigel and uh, Amy, I, I want to apologize for this right here. I, I'm sorry that you guys have to witness this. I'm truly sorry. Yeah, I didn't think it would be this bad. Not, exactly. And just know that this is not a representation of African-American sports. Just let you know that. <laughs> We will find out what happens with this grudge match and with Sam on the baseball field after a quick break. New York, that game kind of got off to a rocky start. And I have to admit, I didn't know that basketball was contact sport. (laughs) That was all. Well, first of all, if there's no harm, there's no foul. 
and keeping T-Dub in range, that was all part of my plan, Nige. Wear him down and work it out. Okay, okay. Well, I was definitely rooting for you, and it was clear to me that you have heart, but it seemed like Trevor might have more skills. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's fair. But like I said, you know I'm not one of those natural-born mm-hmm. athletes. You know, I, I got to work for any all the wins I get. And you know what? That's why I'm really on your team. I yes. love the underdog. Thank you, Nige. I appreciate that. But you know there are some guys at San Quentin who really know how to bring it on the court. Amazing athletes. Totally unlike me. And there's this one guy in particular who's a legend. All right, man, I want to get to the big questions, man. Um, How does it feel, man, to be a two-time Super Bowl champion and be on the sale down the tier from me? Yeah, oh, man. It be, it be cool throughout the day, bro. Like, it don't hit me till it's time to lay it down. You know what I'm saying? And it's quiet in that motherfucker. And now I got really time to myself. And when the reflection gets hard, it's like, fuck, man, what am I doing here? I hate this place. Nige, this guy, Brandon Browner, he was a big deal in the NFL. Okay, before this interview, I had not heard of him. But NFL, I do know that's football. It is indeed football. He played on this legendary defensive squad on the Seattle Seahawks called the Legion of Boom. Hmm. And these guys are known for being really aggressive on defense. No one can get past them. And Brandon Browner, he got two Super Bowl rings. Oof. This guy is definitely the most famous incarcerated athlete I've ever met here at San Quentin. Did people know who you are when you came in here? Did they know that you uh, were? Some, some people did. How does, how does that affect being incarcerated? It's just a part of it. I don't look at it as a, uh, it doesn't change who I am. When I first met you, it seemed like you were angry. And then now you seem happy. For sure. And so I definitely see changes. And they didn't have groups, but I see you reading a lot of books like The Body Keeps Score, and you stay reading business books. Right. Um, like you have some kind of aspirations or something. For sure. You know, I, I look at this as just a part of my story. What do you mean he was angry? How did you note that this was an angry person? Uh, we're close, man. So we always talk. And, and, and like he, all kinds of things would set him off. So he would tell me about what he's angry about this, that day. And sometimes I'm looking at him like, that's not anything to be angry about. I'm naturally just, you know, an angry person somewhat. It's upsetting that I, I made the mistake I did in Cambridge. So I was upset with myself and, you know, bitter, I, I'd probably say more so than anything. Hmm. Well, I'm guessing that being aggressive is an asset mm-hmm. when you play football. Exactly. And I, for the first time I heard you, what was the group? Legion of Boom? Legion of Boom. Uh-huh. And that was a group of really aggressive players? Yeah. Like what What made you aggressive on the field? Can you explain to me what that is? Well, we play a, a violent game and that's just what it was. And one of my uh, greatest attributes was being aggressive. So it went hand in hand with my sport. And did someone have to train you to be aggressive, or did you just grow up? I kind of grew up that way. I got uh, 16 brothers and sisters, 17 of us, so I grew up fighting. <laughs> you know, I grew up fighting, and I grew up in, you know, uh, apartment, low-income housing where it's a lot of kids, and I grew up competitive, so just part of who I am. Yeah, that scrappiness, it served Brandon well when he started playing football professionally at, like, age 20. He had to rough it through a few winners in the Canadian Football League, and then he joined the Seahawks in 2011. He won a Super Bowl ring with the Seahawks in 2014, and the next year he joined my team, the New England Patriots, and uh, he won a Super Bowl there too. He signed a $17 million contract with the Patriots. Million. Yeah, things were good for Brandon. It probably was the funnest time of my life when I played football. What is it like to all of a sudden be making so much money? You go from, for me, I, you know, grew up somewhat poor to, to all of a sudden having all this money, but not really having financial literacy. You know, you, you make it in such a short span of time and you think you can spend as you please, but not knowing that your career is, is really short. What were you excited to buy when all of a sudden you were making? Nice cars and things like that. I had a Bentley Flying Spur. I drove a Hummer, uh, Mercedes 550, S550. Uh, I had an old school Chevelle, 
an old school Chevy Impala. I, I was into cars too. That was my thing, cars. Wait, how does it feel? Like, what is it? What does it feel like to be able to do that? It's the best feeling in the world. That is pretty much exactly what I pictured it would be like to be a professional football player. I remember that he told us about this one party he went to mm-hmm. after he won the Super Bowl with your team, the Patriots. Shit, I was on the stage with uh, uh, Rick Ross, rapping. Uh, word for word with Rick Ross, going in for show. Had hella shots, uh, you know. My family got the party with us. It was an exclusive, you know, Patriots, family, and friends. You know, we all in a mingling and shit, so it was a good time, man. Like, my closest loved ones got to, you know, meet the owners and Tom Brady and, you know, it was one of them uh, special moments in my life, for sure. Brandon retired from football in 2017. He was still in his 30s. Oof, that seems young. Well, Naj, he played professional football for 12 years. Mm. And that's a long time and a lot of abuse for the body to take. Yeah, I guess you're right. But you know what? I get the sense that just because your body is done with football doesn't mean the rest of you is. Yeah, I would say that. That aggression that he brought to the field, that was hard to let go of. So how does that work off the field? Like, how do you turn that off and deal with it? Or can and you that's even? my issue. That was my issue. Uh, I didn't know how to turn it off. <clears throat> and uh, it's something I'll probably have to work on the rest of my life, to be honest with you. Yeah. Because it was an asset for me playing football, but it wasn't so much so in, in the real world. Yeah. You know, instead of having uh, patience and the social skills, communication skills to talk things out or even thought process to walk away. Are your feelings hurt easily? Yeah. I was going to say no, <laughs> but to be honest with you, yeah. So you're pretty sensitive? Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I don't know very much about you, mm-hmm. but I think I know why you're in prison. Mm-hmm. Um, so can I ask you a few questions about that? And then if you don't want to answer, just say pass. Yeah, go ahead. So I think, you're, I think that you're in prison for what I guess would be called domestic violence. Right. Um, how does that happen? How does that uh, just, just not having the emotional, uh, the, the communication skills to talk certain situations out. If I could take a break, I'd probably respond, you know, different. Yeah. I'd probably just get up and walk out of the situation because at the end of the day, it wasn't worth it. So do you worry about that happening again with another person? Uh, I won't let it happen, but I do worry about uh, making mistakes, just being honest with you. I, I, like, you're a big guy, mm-hmm. um, and I, I would think you could be pretty, it would be pretty scary if you're a woman and someone your size is angry mm-hmm. at them. So, I mean, just how do you think about that? Like, it's, so it's, 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 it's horrible to think about it, you know, to scare a woman in that, in that manner, for sure. You know, because I have a daughter myself. Yeah. I wouldn't want my daughter to, you know, a guy to be that way for my daughter to experience, I know. you know, what I made a woman experience. How do you, have you talked to your daughter about it? Now, my daughter's young. She's only five. Oh. So uh, if the time, as she gets older, you know, and we need to have that talk, I most definitely will. When Brandon committed his crime and he got arrested, it was really big news. I know. His rise and fall was just dramatic. Yeah, it's crazy, too. But Brandon's getting out in a few years, and I think that question of how does he live the rest of his life in a different way, Mm -hmm. that's something he's thinking a lot about. Yeah. Ultimately, I want to be a better person, a good man. I want to be a husband. Those things, I think, will feel more gratifying will feel better than anything I ever accomplished that feeling in my heart that I'm a decent human being that's that's what I strive for how will you know when you you're a decent human being I think the anxiety of you know uh the shame goes away there's always going to be situations that can bring anger up out of you when triggers don't bother me when I look at them just as a part of life that's just what that is it's, this is life, and uh, I handle it 
differently. And how close are you to being that that man you want to be? Honestly, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put, put some on it because I haven't had. I'm not out there on the outside and had those experiences. You know. Okay. So you think it's you have to wait till you get out there and you're tested. I don't think or? I have to be out there, but the test will be different out there. We, for one, we're in here with all men. My significant other, I've never lived with her. You know, uh, we were friends when I was out there. Now we're, she's my partner. We haven't had any uh, obstacles or any situations like that. So I think living with her, and that's when the test will come for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Back to the art of dreams. We are indeed. So I got to know, did Sam make the team? Well, you know, Naj, it's prison and things never work out mm-hmm. who you think they're going to. Right. Not long after I talked to her on the field back in the summer, a few cases of COVID popped up and everything shut down. Yep, I remember that. And we couldn't come in either. Nope. And neither could the outside baseball teams that were lined up to play the San Quentin A's. So their season was canceled Again. Oh, so many disappointments. We got ace up the bat. Here we go. But they did salvage one game. Oh, right. strike one. An intramural league game. Two teams of San Quentin incarcerated people. Giants versus A's. What does it feel like to be put on this A's uniform? It feels like something special to me because, you know, I've never put on a uniform before, except a prison outfit. You know, I'm anxious at the same time. It's like putting on a costume for Halloween for the very first time as a child, right? But as a woman, trans woman on top, just putting on the uniform makes me feel like one of them. And uh, that's a brand new thing for me. Going on the field now? Yes, I am. I'm gonna go out to the field right now. I'm gonna do some practice. So I'm throwing or something, you know, hopefully they have me in a bullpen today so I can pitch. And uh, hopefully I do myself proud and everybody else. All right, thank you. In the bottom of the first inning, the A's load the bases. All right, you know what to do, Sam. Hey, right, stay patient. Number Take it slow. Sam comes up to bat. And on the very first pitch... Sam hits a single and drove in two runs. You mean RBIs? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so cool. Then while the pitcher was distracted with the next batter, Simone right here. Oh, Samantha takes off the second. Safe. Safe. Samantha steals the second. Oh, she's a professional. And we caught up with her in the dugout right afterwards. Uh, I was great. I already know how he pitches because I've hit off him plenty of times before in practice. He pitches a curve, the first one. So as soon as I seen the uh, curve, I hit it, and good results came out of it. So I'm proud of that. I was curious, like, whenever the A's do get to play a full season, mm-hmm. what do Sam's chances look like of actually making the yeah, A's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went and found their coach, an incarcerated guy named Will. So Coach Will, how did Sam do today? Sam got a single with the bases loaded, which is, you know, what she's supposed to do. Two run RBI, so she has the ability to make this squad. Now, I'm not saying it's sealed in stone, but she has the ability to make it. The A's end up winning the game 10 to 2. Yep, and I got to come in a few days later so you and I could do a, a post game analysis. Yep, that's that sports talk <laughs> right there. <laughs> post game analysis with Sam. So I talked to Coach Will and, and Anthony after the game, and they said if they were picking the teams right now, mm-hmm. that you're good enough to make the team. Oh, that makes me feel good. That makes me feel real good. Sam told us she was really looking forward to telling her dad all about the game. I am. I'm proud to rub it in his face. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, like a peanut butter sandwich. You know what I mean? Just like, uh, how you like that? Because... He never thought I could do something really manly. This is the only manly thing that he ever seen me do is be in prison, right? And in his eyes, that's probably the best thing that ever happened to try to be manly about me, right? But I'm just as feminine now. I took it upon myself to, like, be a part of something. And so it started out with just volleyball. 
And then I played softball and softball became a love for me. And I played for 10 years, but we only played with each other. We never played outside people. When I came here and I heard that's what they did, I was so excited to be part of something like that, right? It was like clarity for me, you know what I mean? Like, how am I gonna get my humanity back if, if I don't do the things that are exciting that people do on the streets? If I constantly become somebody I'm not in here, I'm gonna be that way when I go out. And I don't wanna be that way, I wanna be a human being. So, E, mm. the A's won, mm-hmm. Sam had a great game, and the okay. coach was pretty positive about her chances to make the team. So, there's just one result we're waiting for. Last time we checked in about this, things were getting off to a pretty elementary start. <laughs> Did either of those jokers ever manage to sink a basket? Oh, the jump shot is up. Oh, off the backboard. Young Dub off the backboard. Was it a two? I was so surprised it went in. I'm just happy the ball went in. Like, Finally, three minutes in, there's a basket. Your brother scored first, and then he scored again, then again. All right, give me half right now, Nigel, and we can end the bet. <laughs> Not so fast, hmm. Erlon, because the scouting reports about your brother's lack of conditioning... They were right on the money. He's already winded. I see it, ladies and gentlemen. Dub has lost his legs. Oh, he can't get around New York. New York started turning things around. Statue of Liberty. Oh, and the three-pointer drops. New York sinks his first three-pointer. He sunk a few more baskets and took the lead. New leader. But... Erlon, your brother had so many stalling tactics. Like, I swear to God, he kept pretending that he had to tie his shoelaces, and he was just doing it to catch his breath. This is all tactic, Nige. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? New York is a marathon, so he got a lot of wind. Totally. Sounds like my Brody is just trying to catch his breath. Dub is bent over at the top of the key with the basketball, stopping the game. Well, as much as I don't like to admit it, I think your brother's cheap stalling tactics actually worked. Soon, he was back on top. Here we go, bro. Point game. This is over. Oh, oh, wait. New York has life. The turnaround, I don't know if he was throwing the ball at me or Nigel. I think he wanted Nigel to shoot the layup. It didn't work. Dub can finish him right now. and won the game. Ladies and gentlemen, New York, come talk to me, baby. Talk to me, man. What do you, where'd you go wrong? The shot, the stamina was working, but the shot wasn't. It wasn't, I wasn't shooting at a higher shot percentage. I probably shot 30 some percent. I'm a 50 to 60 percent shoot out here, especially on T-bums. Uh, just the shot was off, man, that's all. Well, I want you to know he respect your game now. He got to, he said I wouldn't score eight. He was gonna blow me out, bum this, bum that. He damn near lost that mother sucker. I was two shots away from winning it all. Every trash can deserve a stake every now and then. So all I'm saying is I underestimated your condition. I already knew you was going to foul all day long. That's why I said no foul unless it's obvious. No, you, you, no, listen, listen. Nige, time to pay up. <laughs> okay, okay, you're getting your pay, don't worry. So, Erlon, when you were inside, I mean, you were always down in the media lab working mm-hmm. um, and sometimes pretty late into the evening. And I know you ran... But I don't remember if you actually played any, like, sports. Nah, I didn't, I didn't like too much sports based on, you know, things can get intense when individuals get to trash talking. Sometimes people have, you know, these attitudes oh. they have on the court. This is a whoop de whoop shot, and then they say something like that, we fight. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to say the bravado inside is pretty intense. I get kind of tired of it, even though it is actually funny. Yeah, and I wasn't really with that. You're more like the solo runner. Yeah, the solo runner, be in my own lane. Get out of my way. <laughs> so I never took sports that serious in there, but I know New York does. And that makes me kind of feel bad that he lost to Trevor. I know. Honestly, Erlon, I felt kind of bad too. Yeah. But New York did get 
some redemption from a kind of unexpected spot. It happened recently when New York and I were once again up by the basketball court with a recorder. This doesn't look very heavy. Well, how much you think it is? I think it's like 100 pounds. Nah, 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 nah. It's, it's more like two. Okay, wait, wait, can you describe what we're talking about? It's a picnic bench. It's a jail picnic bench. It got tattoos? Yeah, it got tattoos. It's cast iron. That's cast iron with the wood. That's why it's heavy. That's cast iron. I know exactly the benches they're talking about. Guys are always hanging out at them, watching the games, giving haircuts, talking shit, you know. Prison shit. Yeah, so the last couple months since I've been going back in, Erlon, I've mm-hmm. noticed these guys using those picnic tables as like a makeshift weightlifting station. So they put down two crates with a blanket over it, and then the guy lies down, and he's like benching the table. So he's going to lay down, and he's going to bench press the bench, and he needs two spotters on the left side and the right side okay. to make sure there's no accidents or any type of injury. Right now, um, they're they're grabbing both sides to lift it up. Yeah, so he's gonna lay down, and now he's bench pressing. Oh my God, that thing is coming so close to his chest. I don't, whoa. Yeah, he's got it though. And you said New York was there with you? Yes. I know he's not gonna let this competitive opportunity pass him by. No way. Oh, oh wait a second, New York. Oh, he's taking his jacket off. Okay. He's taking his jacket off. Oh, yeah. right All right. Wait, wait, New York. Let's get a prediction. How many are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to go for five. No, let's just go for two. Okay, wait, he's going I'm for five. What do you predict? I think he's going to do one and a half. One and a half? I, I think he got about three. I don't think he can lift it at all. <laughs> oh, yeah, he got five minutes ago for sure. Okay, okay. Yo, let's keep counting. Nah, nah, you might kill me, bro. Listen, when you lay down mm-hmm. and you take this, mm-hmm. we are not going to let it go until you tell us to let it go. Okay, well, okay. Do not release this okay. thing until we take it off for you. Okay. Cut, okay, okay. okay. We got you. You got it. Uh-oh. Nah, go to hell, man. You got to touch your neck. No, I don't. There you go. You got to touch your neck. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. Two. Four. That's intense. Five. Six. Holy. You didn't work out that hard earlier today. New York. Oh, my God. Hold up. I'm seeing stars. We were wrong. Yeah. Well, I underestimated the guy, man. I just took it as his gray hairs and older. You know that maybe his bones couldn't handle it. Yeah. Good job, son. I, yeah, good job. E, we got some sad news recently about our friend Charlie Spencer. Yeah, he was just in our music episode a few weeks ago, and he was battling late stage cancer. So I kept checking in on him by the phone, but at a certain point, he stopped answering. I know, and I remember you called me on a Sunday, and you said, "Can you go? You know, check in on him." Yeah, check in on him. I remember where he lives. So I drove over there. And, and remember, he was like in a very tall high rise. Right, the, right. And so it was like a building you can't just walk into. And um, I rang the buzzer and luckily the manager let me in. And um, I told her I was looking for my friend Charlie. Right. And her face just went white. Mm. And she said, I've got some really sad news. Um, Charlie died a week ago. Mm. And, um, oh, God. But, you know, of course it was hard, but the cool thing was, like, we got to talk about Charlie. And you know what she said? Hmm. This probably won't surprise you. She said everyone in the building loved Charlie. So many people would spend time with him, listening to him play his guitar and talking to him. So the good thing I left with was that he wasn't alone, you know? Right. And, you know, I recorded Charlie reading the credits for that music episode. Mm-hmm. And I had met him down by Lake Merritt in Oakland, And I kind of knew that that was the last time I was going to see this dude. Yeah. And we sat in his car and we just talked. I know you wanted to come see the water. What was was about the water, man? See. So this water. And I'm sitting here talking. People walking by. Mm -hmm. Cars going by. This is sustaining Water is life. Water is life. 
But something's out of place in your life. We could come down here on a sunshiny day. Mm-hmm. Sit on this little bitty bench here. You know. Bust the old cooler out with some set up or something. Sit there, throw a line in the water, and fish, or pretend to fish. Uh-huh, just, just cast, that, but, cast that line. Yes. And casting that line is the connection. And, mm-hmm. and at that time, this is when you're reconnecting. This is, this yeah, is. I was just tripping off the life that was going around here. You was talking about the people walking by, the cars going by, the dogs walking by. Listen. That's what it's all about. I'm not scared to die. This episode of Air Hustle was produced by Rashawn New York Thomas with Nigel Poor, Erlon Woods, John Yaya Johnson, Rashid Zinneman, Bruce Wallace, and Tony DeFoya. It was sound designed and engineered by Antoine Williams with music from Antoine, David Jassy, and Rashid Zinneman. Amy Stanett edits the show. Shubnam Sigmund is our digital producer, and Julie Shapiro is the executive producer for Radiotopia. Ear Hustle would like to thank Anthony Evans, Dijon Joy, Jeremiah Brown, and Steve Reichardt for talking to them for this episode. Ear Hustle would also like to thank Warden Ron Broomfield. And as you know, every episode of Ear Hustle has to be approved by this guy here. So, Lieutenant Robinson, what is the Field of Dreams? So, the Field of Dreams is this place, this magical place, and it's inside the walls of San Quentin on our main yard where the baseball field is located. The, the basketball field is kind of a little bit in the background, but it's this amazing place where people come and everything that they thought they could be or they should be or they were, uh, they're able to bring it to life at the Field of Dreams at San Quentin. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson, the public information officer at San Quentin State Prison, and I will say that I approve this episode. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunities for communities impacted by incarceration. Air Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Radiotopia is a collection of independent, listener-supported podcasts. Some of the best podcasts around. Hear more at radiotopia.fm. I'm Nigel Poor. I'm Erlon Woods. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. You have a good night, man, and I definitely tap in with what 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 we're talking about. Okay. All right. You have a good night, bro. You too. One love. One. Radio Tokyo.